Financial Survival Network, helping you survive and thrive in the new economy. Go to CarryLutz.com and sign up for 30 free micro trainings on financial survival. 1490 WGCH, this is Kerry Lutz, and you're listening to the Financial Survival Network, which is brought to you by Miles Franklin. They've been in business selling gold and silver for over 20 years, and I'm a customer because when you buy, they ship. For more information, find them on the web at milesfranklin.com or give them a call at 800-822-8080 and get a free quote. If you noticed, there's a municipal finance crisis going on around the country. All those municipal bonds that were peddled by well-intentioned financial salesmen as the the safe investment aren't looking so safe these days. And if you want to know why, I've got Tom Riley. He's written a book, Rethinking Public Sector Compensation and Whatever Happened to the Public Interest. He can explain in much better terms than I can what went wrong. Hey, Tom, welcome to the Financial Survival Network. Jerry, thanks for having me. So you wrote this book. I guess the first thing I have to ask you is you were manager of Clark County, Nevada from 2001 to 2006. And I guess you often felt like a lone voice in the wilderness. What happened to make you want to really write this book? Well, I think twofold. One is that, you know, at the time, I began talking about how our compensation system is not sustainable uh, and that some serious reform would have to take place. Uh, At that time, you know, Las Vegas and much of the nation was uh, kind of in this phantom prosperity. We thought things were going well, the economy was going well, and there was not a lot of conversation or kind of openness to uh, approach this topic. When things were going well, people didn't want to focus on anything that would lead to any type of uh, division. Um, that coupled with, you know, I, I am a, a university professor uh, by uh, profession, both before and after I served as county manager. So, you know, the topic of how the uh, our personnel system, the public sector, how sustainable it is, is an academic interest of mine. Right. So, so it was from both practical experience and academic experience. And what would you say the level of knowledge or ignorance among the general public about this catastrophe that's brewing just over the horizon, actually certain places it's here now, what's the level of public enlightenment on this topic? Well, certainly the economic uh, downturn in this country, plus the increased media attention has brought this topic more to the forefront of uh, policy debates and in newspapers across the United States. I mean, four or five years ago, there was very seldom any type of discussion about something uh, like public sector compensation. Uh, clearly now there's much more um, interest in it. Uh, however, you know, the, the adoption of a lot of these unsustainable policies uh, by the individuals responsible for um, uh, the, the current system really uh, didn't occur in a very open and transparent manner. Um, and that's kind of contributed to the problem now. And in some sense, you know, the media's increased coverage and then citizens have kind of woken up to the fact that, you know, there's limited dollars out there to serve, to, uh, serve the public. And, you know, most um, states and local governments, unlike the federal government, have to balance their budget. They have two things they can do. They can either raise taxes or they can cut services. And both are pretty p- politically unpopular. Since governments primarily are service industry or they facilitate delivery of services, the bulk of the costs are labor costs. And so there's been a lot more scrutiny about how did we get to this situation where we've adopted a lot of these uh, uh, unsustainable benefits and um, uh, pay uh, systems. Uh, You raise a great point. And there is one other way that they can live within their means, and that is to cut back on salaries and benefits of their employees to make them more competitive with the private sector. Because in the private sector, very few companies actually give a full-blown defined benefit pension plan. Very few companies pay 100% of medical from from the moment you start working there to the moment uh, you've retired and for the rest of your life, and numerous other benefits, not to mention bloated vacations, sick leave, 
I mean, I assume that all of these problems were present in Clark County as well as uh, many, many other places around the country. You're absolutely right, is that that is an option, but it's been a very difficult challenge, as you've even seen being played out in municipality uh, municipality across the United States, because many of these have been adopted through collective bargaining agreements, and the ability to make uh, changes uh, in short term has been uh, very difficult. But, you know, I think that really underscores this, this whole issue, and I think kind of the crux of the book has been that um, we really... Uh, reward and manage public employees in all the wrong ways. Uh, we, we basically, if you will, uh, put the primary, defer a lot of their benefits and pay to after they leave. And you're absolutely right, is that uh, most public employees have a defined benefit. That means they are a guaranteed pension for life with inflation, and they have access to retiree health care uh, subsidized, either with little or no co- co-payment. And these have disappeared rapidly in the the private sector, and they're pretty much non-existent. Um, So what we have is that the system is too heavily skewed towards time served and longevity, and not a lot of focus on entrepreneurship, uh, performance, and innovation. And so what we've done over the years is we've created this personnel system that number one is unsustainable, number two creates serious problems for service delivery, is inefficient, and is really creates an ethically troublesome personnel system. Not to mention that for the people who have to go work uh, in the private sector where expectations of productivity and accountability are much higher, they look at the governmental employees who originally, going back 40, 50 years ago, people got government jobs because there was job security, they paid less, you did get some pension benefits and medical, but they weren't as big factors back then. But basically, they went there, they took less pay because they got job security. And somehow, that aspect, that enticement got forgotten. And now, vis-a-vis the public sector, they're paid two or three times more, especially when you factor in the cost of these benefits, and they get multi-million dollar retirements, right? Well, and I think, yeah, that that's truly was the trade-off. The trade-off was in the past that you work for the public sector, and the trade-off is that you have job security, and then you would have these deferred guaranteed pensions. So you, you got paid less. And now that there seems to be much more of an equalization of pay, I mean, it depends how you calculate it. If you control for education and, and some of those other factors, um, you know, basically is that you're you're better off as a blue-collar worker in the public sector and a white-collar worker in the private sector. But this is the difference. How do you put a value on the issue of job security and those deferred benefits, those, those pensions for life and those subsidized retiree health care? When individuals can retire on average about five years earlier in the public sector from the private sector, and you guarantee retiree health care and, and people retiring at 55 and live into 90, those costs are astronomical. And that's why today when I talk about it being unsustainable, There's estimates anywhere between we are one trillion to three trillion in unfunded liabilities collectively across the United States for pension costs and for retiree health care. So when you have a system that is conflicted because you have employee groups, public managers and elected officials operating what I call in an iron triangle, a closed policy making, uh, and they can adopt benefits that are deferred. Uh, and the bill comes due long after they leave office, you're creating a system that is, is, is incredibly unsustainable. But it also it goes to the heart of who do you want working uh, to deliver some of the services? I mean, obviously, any employer would want to attract the best and the brightest. But our system is not set up that way in the public sector. The public sector is set up this way. It's that you stay for 30 years, don't cause any problems, and you get a nice benefit when you leave very little reward for performance or entrepreneurship, and you are actually financially penalized if you try to move from to the public, to the private, to the nonprofit, or to another public agency, because your retirement system is not portable. Another thing I bring up in this book, new generation, the new workforce, or individuals that have portfolios of many different jobs, where they worked in different sectors and different industries, and they bring that that, that breadth of experience to an employer to help solve issues for problem solving for decision making. We, we do exactly the opposite. We say, you, you don't leave. And if you leave, 
because your pension system is not portable, you'll be financially penalized. So whether you like it or not, we want you to stay for 30 years. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that um, institutional knowledge is not good for any organization. But when it's skewed too heavily, like it is in the public sector, it creates some serious problems just about who is it we're attracting and what we, we seem to be attracting, although there's a lot of very talented individuals, we attract those that, that want more job security versus more risk-taking and entrepreneurship and um, uh, uh, performance. And then they've got these protections. God forbid you want to fire one of them. In New York City, they had this guy, he was on suspension for 11 years, teacher, for making inappropriate gestures and comments to the females in the class. So they couldn't fire him. They lost in court. So they put him in a rubber room and he got about 100000 a year. And in the meantime, he built a legal practice and a real estate portfolio. And this thing, the whole outrage came out about three, four months ago. So he said, you know what? It's time to retire on a nice six figure pension and get my free taxpayer funded health benefits. How do you did you encounter such problems in, in Clark County? I did. I did both from a practical standpoint as well as an academic standpoint, and I included that in my book. I mean, the civil service system was set up a time basically to to ensure that uh, we avoid political patronage. So, but what we've evolved into a system is that we have such excessive protections um, that it makes it very difficult to manage and reward public employees. I mean, one of the things I do point out about public and private sector unions is that in the public sector unions, they and public sector workers have these civil service protections at the federal, state, and local level that are non-existent in the private sector. And and, and part of, you know, we, we tend to lump in public and private sector employ, uh, unions as if they're the same thing. They evolve differently, they operate differently. And in the private sector, they basically operate in a market economy. You push too far, the business, you can go out of business. In the public sector, we work in a political system and in a monopoly that, um, you know, pushing too hard sometimes is non-existent because many of the managers who actually will receive the exact same benefits that they negotiate for their employees. You, t you couple that with the, pl the powerful political machines of uh, uh, public employee groups that basically can uh, contribute large sums of money and put across the bargaining people, the very per people they elect. So you have a system where, you know, if they don't do what they want, they, they can unelect them. So you have this very, very troublesome system, very conflictual system that coupled with very onerous civil service system really creates some serious challenges for service delivery. Yeah, I know. We all see it. And we have some states that are right to work states like uh, down south, I think, Texas, Florida, other places where if you want to be in a union, you can be, but you write the check. There's no mandatory dues check off from mandatory withholding from your pay. And you make the decision whether to be a member of that union. And then we have places like New York and California and Illinois, where the price of admission is your membership in the union. Sometimes it's, it's indirect where you work there for three months and then you're included in there. And then other times it's just, you have to be a member to get that job. And is, is doing what Indiana did where they just passed a right to work law where no mandatory dues check off, is that part of the solution? Well, I mean, I think you're absolutely right is that we do have this patchwork across the United States of how we deal with public sector unions. In the South, actually, many places it's actually prohibited from uh, uh, collective bargaining in the public sector. And then you have others that are like a right to work state, um, like Nevada and others. And then others basically is that uh, because of a free rider concern, basically they require, if a majority of individuals vote to collectively bargain, everybody has to not only join, but you have to pay dues. And then in other states, you can actually opt out a part of that contribution that goes to political means. Right. Um, but, you know, at will employment uh, and the issue of choice of whether to join a union or not join a union is something I recommend and included in my uh, book. But, you know, uh, for example, Nevada. Nevada is a very interesting state is that you have the state legislature that prohibits collective bargaining at the state level. 
However, they've given and granted that at local levels. So you have state legislators who can be seen as very pro-union and receive large contributions because they can advocate for it at the local level. But I think they're very skeptical of adopting it for themselves because they know the challenges that uh, it presents and they know they were not they would not have been able to respond as expeditiously at the state level if they had the collective bargaining agreements that have been in place. Yeah, it's kind of a little schizophrenic uh, situation there in Nevada where you will allow it at the local level and not at the state level. And you think, well, it's good for one, should be good for the other. And yet, uh, you know, they have to kowtow, I guess, to the unions to some extent. But what's the solution here? Uh, well, obviously, good, yeah. You know, and, and in all fairness, you know, in, in some states there's pension crisis where there's not collective bargaining. So mm-hmm. what I what I've gone to, you know, great uh, pains in the book is to kind of point that, you know, it's it, it's more of a it's a complicated issue where there's a lot of factors that converged at one time. Clearly, the economy has brought it to light. Two is that the um, the media has had increased attention, so they have kind of pointed out a lot of the differences, and they've done a lot more vigorous job of kind of covering it in a lot of municipalities at the state level. The rise of public sector unions has contributed. I mean, we're at a basically in the private sector, it's it's less than seven percent at an all time low, but it's increasing rapidly in the public sector to approaching forty percent of all public sector workers. But the other piece is that you have this, this, this total lack of transparency, whether it's unions or employee groups. But you've had a lack of transparency of benefits being adopted. So usually when there's any type of discussion that occurs around adopting pay and benefits, they talk about the cost of living. And in the scheme of things, that is a small part of the pie. What you rarely hear is a discussion about what all the components of a contract entails and what the cost of all those components are. In my book, for example, I outline what a firefighter contract looks like. So if the only public discussion is that they got a 1% or 2% increase, really it fails to tell the whole story when you look at callback pay, uh, leave, et cetera, or having the state assume all its um, employer contribution. So what there has to be from transparency wise, and what I recommend, and I have a series of recommendations, but on the transparency piece, I argue is that, number one, there, there, there has to be much more openness about what the true cost of every contract is. I mean, the very difficult thing is that in collective bargaining, it's not like every two or three years when you negotiate a new contract, you start from zero. It's cumulative. So whatever you had before builds upon it. So what you've had over the years is a constant building up. And then to do a takeaway means that you reduce what has been collectively bargained before. Most arbitrators are loath to come in there and do a takeaway. So what you've had, you've had these accumulation of these contracts over a large period of time. But what we need at the municipal level, the county level, and the state level, is that we need to have, anytime there's uh, an adoption of benefits and pay, that there's an outside audit that identifies the true cost, not only currently how we're gonna pay for it, but how we're gonna pay for it uh, in the future. Because so much of the adoption of public pay is deferred to after individuals leave office. So we're passing the problem to future generations of elected officials, public officials, and citizens. Where elected groups have not been responsible because they're too beholden to employee groups, there's probably some merit to actually taking some of those votes to the public on the issue of uh, um, uh, benefits. For example, the liberal city of San Francisco has had on their books for a long period of time that any increase in their pension has to be voted on by the people. So it's not this draconian concept out there that, you know, is is only reserved for very, very conservative populations. But the issue of openness and transparency is, is real important. The other area is just around the issue of pensions. I mean, you know, when we talk about the issue of retiree health care, why did we even start the notion of retiree health care? Well, we did so because public employees can retire much earlier than the age they qualify for um, Medicare and Social Security. Um, so that's a problem in itself. When people are living longer, we need to increase the retirement age. And I, I think we see that occurring across the United States where the retirement age or p- there's a penalty if you retire earlier being increased. And that's just something that just has to occur. The problem is is that the courts have said repeatedly that this can only apply to new individuals. So we're not going to see the cost for a longer period of time. 
Um, but on the issue of the, uh, the, the pensions is that, well, if I can, let me just give you two extremes what's sure. happened during this. One is in the city of San Diego and one is the state of New Jersey. One is an election of, of, of Democrats that, that begin to populate uh, the city council in San Diego. And one is about a Republican governor in New Jersey. And it's not Christie. Uh, let's go to San Diego. And what happened in San Diego in the uh, uh, late 80s and 90s is that you had a new uh, democratically elected city council that received significant contributions from the unions. So over a period of time, they didn't publicly want to talk about what increases they were giving to employees. So instead of giving them cost of living increases, they sweetened the pension and retiree health care to just unsustainable means. For example, they had that if there was any leftover money, they got a 13th paycheck. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it, that's it, nice. 13th month, huh? <laughs> and what they did is that the union, the elected official, the mayor and the city council, as well as the city manager and his staff, went to extraordinary means to conceal their self-dealing. And what they did is that they increased benefits. At the same time, they, they stopped making payments or decreased payments in their pension system. Because what happened is that they begin to realize early on that all these promises as they became due were crowding out services and you couldn't fill potholes. There was not enough money for public safety and safety net programs were falling aside. So what they did over a period of time is that they've had this disastrous course of in continuing increased benefits as payoffs to unions and, and to uh, public employees, at the same time not make payments in the pension system. Well, the system, you know, came due, uh, the pay came due, the economic crisis still, and that's why, you you know, San Diego, which was known at the time I was actually county manager as uh, one of the most efficient cities, became quickly known as Enron by the sea, given <laughs> the, the public corruption. Yeah. Let's, let's go to a state level on the other uh, side of the coast in New Jersey. We have uh, Christy Todd Whitman, who was a very popular governor at the time, uh, came in, moderate policies, but wanted to give a tax break to uh, the citizens of uh, uh, New Jersey. And what she did is she saw a pension system. And it wasn't underfunded. They actually had some money in there. So what she did is she actually took money from the pension system to offer tax breaks and then stop making payments. And so New Jersey hasn't made payments in their pension system. So come along, you know, Governor Christie, and rightfully so, it is one of the top five states. Um, it's about 64% funded. Anything below 80 is, is, is a huge red flag because they stopped making payments in the system. So, you know, part of this issue is that you have these ridiculously high unfunded liability. And while most states at least have a plan for pensions, the majority of them have no plan for retiree health care. Let's go to Nevada, a very small state. Its pension system is around 78% funded, below the red mark, but not as disastrous as other states. They do that somewhat because everybody has to go to one system. So there's, you know, whether you're a public employee, there's some economies of scale, unlike places like California where every municipality has their own. Um, but what they haven't done is they have no plan at all. They have, the last time I checked, it was a $2 billion unfunded liability in a small state of Nevada for retiree health care because there's been no plan put forth to address it. So what you happen is you have these unfunded liabilities, and this is also one of the main themes in my book, is that you know, make no, people don't like to talk about this, but this all comes from the same operating budget. And so if you start making good on your unfunded liability and retiree health care, and you're already trying to make catch up in your pension system, it's going to crowd out services that citizens have. Um, and so, you know, long term, we can raise the retirement age, increase employer employee contribution, move individuals to 401k type like they do in the private sector or hybrid models, reduce or do away with retiree health care. I mean, on retiree health care. OK, so say that we feel guilty because they can retire early and we want to do a gap before they can retire for, for Medicare at 62. Well, why the hell aren't we just playing it to age 62? Why are we giving retiree health care for life? Lifetime. I mean, little yeah. things like that, you know, could be addressed in a responsible manner um, and, and have a large impact on the financial liabilities that these states and counties have. Yeah, well, I agree with you there. And reason needs to prevail, but I don't see that happening. I don't see there being the political will in most states to really take the public uh, employee unions and workers head on and say can't do this and then you do have constitutional problems where you can't cut back on existing benefits for employees i think 
there's an argument to be made that if the if the fund is insolvent and you keep doing what you're doing to make it insolvent, you're actually hurting them and cutting it back is the only way to really protect them. But the courts have to decide that. The one option that I see coming down the pike, and I think it's going to happen in a huge way, is municipal bankruptcy because they get to abrogate the contracts, outsource. There's an issue of things like pensions and education, whether bankruptcy code, whether bankruptcy law and bankruptcy decisions by the judges will trump constitutional law, which says you can't cut back on this stuff. My gut feel is that the federal judiciary has never been one to to uh, to basically uh, wither from the prospect of expanding federal judicial power, just like any other government agency, they're going to say that the code and as a result, the bankruptcy judges decisions trump the constitution. They already say that it trumps state law. And then we're going to really see this thing come to a head where waves of municipalities go bankrupt because they just can't sustain the system. It's unsustainable. Well, we, yeah, you're right. And I think that is a large fear. And I know that states and the federal government really are concerned about the number of cities that are contemplating uh, issues of bankruptcy. I mean, we, you know, at one time, <clears throat> from an academic standpoint, we talked about one case. It was in Orange County. And that resulted sure. from some excessive risk taking that um, the individuals who are overseeing the pension fund. But since then, we have seen just alarming number of uh, cities. I mean, we've had uh, Vallejo, California. We've had Pritchard, Alabama. We've had Central Falls, Rhode Island. Sure. The largest bankruptcy to date. And, and all of those were clearly as a result of their promises they made for pension employee contracts. Uh, Jefferson City, Alabama, which uh, filed in 2011, is at this point the largest bankruptcy, although that has to deal more primarily around uh, some corruption and bribery around the sewer system, but also the pensions. But in California alone, you have Stockton, Hercules, and Lincoln all contemplating uh, bankruptcy, and you have large municipalities like Los Angeles um, that, and many other places like Gary, in Indiana, et cetera, that are in really financially tough straits. And, and the states are trying to do everything they can to prevent these type of bankruptcies. Uh, but I, I do think um, as more and more of these are successful, you're going to see that becoming an option in, in, in many states and in many municipalities. Oh, yeah. I think it, it's there's a certain inevitability, although certain states like New Jersey, Michigan, I think Kentucky restrict the right of a municipality to file without uh, state approval. But in Michigan, you have the alternative, which is they just basically appoint a dictator or to receivers. run places. Yeah, to run a place like Flint. And it's like he just goes in there with an axe and starts chopping till there's nothing left. So I don't know what's worse. Um, thinking the bankruptcy route at least can work rationally. It's worked with corporations, worked with other governmental entities, but... At some point, the political will's not there, and there has to be a way to deal with this because the alternative is just these things collapse into insolvency, and there's no government, which which people really don't want that in the worst way. But I think you are seeing uh, some governors and some mayors. I mean, you know, my sense is that kind of once you kind of get into county government or state government, um, you tend to be a lot more conservative physically from a physical standpoint because of the the constraints you have about balancing out delivery of services. But I mean, you, you are seeing uh, with uh, several Democratic uh, governors, and including your own state of New York, uh, Como, uh, um, uh, in Illinois, Quinn, and in California, Brown, who put together some pretty, um, you know, some people would say modest, others would say more bold reforms that they're receiving some opposition to. You've had the mayor of uh, Los Angeles come out clearly with his concern that their obligations are crowding out services to deliver service, you know, and, and you would not have heard that, you know, five or so years ago. So I think that um, yes, you're getting uh, increased attention. People, this is much more of a focus of policy debates than it has in the past. And I do think, I mean, at the last count of the, uh, uh, the Council on um, 
uh, state legislators have come up with, I think uh, 43 states are contemplating some type of changes in their pension system. Uh, so I think that you're, you're having this, uh, this discussion at least and this awareness occurring at a much um, a more transparent manner than you've had before. Yeah, well, we have to be grateful for small favors and hopefully it's part of a trend and perhaps when the unions see what damage is done to them when these municipalities go bankrupt and everything, all their benefits get chopped up and, and then they're really out on their own, maybe they'll think twice or they'll probably do what they always do and lobby for a new law. Anyway, we've got to wrap up, Tom. Just uh, tell us, I, I think your book's not been released yet, which I don't uh, usually interview people prior to release, but it's coming out real soon, isn't it? Yeah, it's actually, it's coming out this week. Um, and it's, um, in order to get uh, information on it, it's um, uh, rethinkingpublicpay.com. So you can order the book, you can uh, kind of read a couple chapters on there, but it's www.rethinkingpublicpay.com. Uh, the publisher is uh, Sharp uh, uh, Publisher, which is actually out of New York and London, um, M.E. Sharp. Uh, and um, you can also go online there in M.E. Sharp and order the book also. And also I'm looking at it pre available for pre-order on Amazon, and I hope you can make it out to uh, the East Coast here and get to the Empire Center and the Manhattan Institute. Uh, if they haven't sent you an invitation yet, hopefully they will. I'll shoot them an email because this this is the issue for for local government. And the more it gets discussed, at least the closer we'll come to an eventual solution. Hey, I thank you so much for coming Thanks on. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the conversation. Hey, and we'll talk to you again after the book comes out and I have a chance to read it. Great. Thank you. Hey, you be well. Good. Take care.